We'll turn to uh, Matthew chapter 20 as we look at a little parable that Jesus tells. It's in total context of, uh, of um, Peter's question that we looked at last week in, in regards to the rich young ruler who, uh, remember, uh, came to Jesus and wanted to follow him and uh, recognized he was, in a sense, the Messiah, came with great faith, but uh, uh, Jesus, in a sense, takes him through uh, and uses the law to show him that uh, in his own heart, he really esteemed his, his riches more than men the Lord. And, and, uh, and he chose not to uh, leave or forsake those things to follow the Lord and went away sad. And then Peter jumps in at that point, uh, we would assume, very proud of himself and the fact that, uh, well, he didn't do it, but, you know, we've left everything, Lord. So what's, what's in it for us? What will be our, our reward? Well, Jesus then talks to him about that and the fact that um, uh, the 12 apostles will in his millennial kingdom set on 12 thrones. And he says, and for everybody else who sacrificed anything in this life, they will receive a hundred times as much in, uh, in this life to come. And Jesus is laying out a very important principle and that is uh, what we call delayed gratification. It's, uh, it's really at the heart of a worldview, of a Judeo-Christian worldview. It's certainly uh, something that, um, that our uh, ancestors understood uh, very well. Kathy shared last week about uh, uh, in Okinawa going and finding, you know, uh, her family there and having her, her grandfather having left Okinawa when he was uh, 17 year, years old. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of people did that and they did not do it for their own comfort or safety or pleasure. Uh, they did it for the sake of delayed gratification. They didn't know that they would have a better life. What they believed, though, if they sacrificed, maybe their children would have a better life. And if not them, maybe their grandchildren would have a better life. And so they, again, understood this concept of delayed uh, gratification. What Jesus is talking about to, to Peter in his question and the others is that Yes, there will be difficulty in this life, but if you will follow me and serve me and sacrifice now, delay the gratification as opposed to self-gratification, then in the future it will be well worth it. I just wanted to read a, a fairly lengthy quote from uh, John Ascroft. He's the, uh, uh, we know him, of, more familiar with him as being the, uh, uh, the first attorney general under President Bush 2001. And... Um, and I, I was glad to see him get that position. He's a very outspoken Christian. His dad uh, was a minister for a number of years. He's a former governor, two-term governor of, uh, uh, of Missouri. Uh, once shared a, a little cubicle in a law office next to an, another familiar guy named Clarence Thomas, <laughs> who now sits on the Supreme Court and, and uh, asked John Ashcroft to, uh, to swear him in at the, uh, at, at the ceremony. But... Um, uh, having left that office, he, uh, he authored a book entitled Lessons from a Father to a Son, uh, Men of Integrity, and, and was asked the, the following couple of questions in an interview in regards to the book. And, and the first question was, uh, people often discuss the importance of delayed gratification. Uh, what do you mean when you talk about displaced gratification? And then Ashcroft <laughs> says, uh, in delayed gratification, we put off something so that we can enjoy something even better later on. Avoiding a sex life before marriage, for instance, so that we can more fully enter into a deep love of the marital union. In displaced gratification, we put off something so that the gratification can go on to somebody else. Within marriage, for example, we put our spouse's needs ahead of our own. 
And then he says that when William Booth finally left the Salvation Army, he sent a one-word telegram to every member of his army. That one word embodied the guiding principle of Booth's life. It simply said, others. Uh, the second question the interviewer asked was, what is the reward of displaced gratification? And as Croft said, the man or woman who understands delayed and displaced gratification realizes that, that others are what it's all about. Instead of demanding our rights and satisfaction, we can work for the rights of others. We can find fulfillment in seeing other people satisfied. And we can serve instead of trying to conquer. Displaced gratification is the oil that keeps our society running smoothly. And then finally, the last question, where do you draw your inspiration to live this way? And he says, learning to put the needs of others above your own is the displaced gratification my father taught me about. The ultimate understanding of displaced gratification is reflected in the life of Christ who gave up heaven for earth, who could have been crowned king, who could have called 10,000 angels to rescue him from the cross. Instead, he accepted brutal, humiliating torture on our behalf. He put serving others ahead of serving his own needs. Delayed gratification, very important cornerstone to what our lives should be all about. And Peter doesn't quite get it. What's in it for us? What's in it for me? I'm kind of proud of the fact of what I've sacrificed for you, Lord. What's in it for me? Well, I'm, we're glad that he asked the question because it leads into this parable. Matthew 20, verse 1 to 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day, sent them into his vineyard. About the third hour he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. About the eleventh hour he went out and found others still standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about the 11th hour came and each received a denarius. So when those who came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who have hired the last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work in the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, friend, am I not being unfair to you? I'm not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have a right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous. So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Now that's the comment he ended with, with the discussion with Peter, when Peter says, what's in it for me? What will I get out of this? And, uh, and again, tells the parable, and then ends with the same principle, the same comment. First thing we want to look at is the fact that Jesus tells a parable, this parable to us, so that we'll understand the proper perspective on this idea of rewards. And Again, it's in the context of uh, the idea of rewards comes from Peter. That's in, uh, in chapter 19, verse 27, where he says, We've left everything to follow you. What then will there be for, uh, for us? So, uh, we're, again, we're thankful that Peter is the guy that asks these, these kinds of questions because it gives the Lord an opportunity to enumerate upon them. And, uh, and as I mentioned already, he, he said that in his millennial kingdom, at the renewal of all things... When, uh, when he's sitting on his throne, then they'll sit on the 12 thrones, uh, judging the 12 tribes of Israel, and, and everybody else is 100, uh, 100 times as much. So again, what's the problem? I think the problem is, is that uh, uh, certainly we can continue to see a selfishness within Peter, a pride within Peter, uh, and it's that conversation that leads to, uh, to the parable. And um, we will receive rewards, all of us, for what we do for, for the Lord in, in this life. But how much will it be? How do we view this whole thing of rewards? That's the, uh, the whole point of, of the parable. 
Uh, the idea of reward is brought up again by a concerned mother in this chapter in verse 21. If you look there, this is the mother of James and John. She's heard now that her sons are going to sit on thrones one day. She wants to know which ones. She said to Jesus, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in, in your kingdom. So she's concerned about this idea of, of rewards as well. What's in it for us? Well, you're going to get a throne. Okay, which one? <laughs> and then we, we read after this that, uh, and we'll look at that more next week, that the other disciples, when they came along and heard about it, were indignant. They were indignant because they had the same concern. What's in it for me and, and how much? And Jesus says, that's, that's the wrong perspective when, when I talk about giving you a reward. It's interesting, isn't it, that it's by God's grace that he, that he saves us. It's by his grace that he enables us to do anything on his behalf that we're not capable of uh, in, in and of ourselves. And then when we do it at his enabling, he rewards us for it. Uh, it's, it's amazing. So he says, so that's what I'm going to do. And, uh, and you can have two perspectives you can either be blown away by my generosity or you can grumble and complain. And so he tells the parable. A couple of things as we continue in point two. In the parable, some workers wanted a specific reward. That's very important to note. The landowner hires workers at, uh, at different times during the day. Jewish day started at six in the morning. So some are hired at six, some at nine in the morning, some at noon, and then some at the end at at uh, three in the afternoon. The grape harvest is usually done in, uh, in August, and uh, the concern as it is today in uh, areas of the world where grapes are, are harvested uh, still is that <clears throat> you worry about the rains coming uh, because the rains will spoil the crops. So uh, in this context, in this parable, the concern apparently with the landowner is that it's time to get the grape harvest in if he sees any bad weather during the day, he's going to keep getting more guys, more guys, more guys until he can get it done so he doesn't lose any of the crops. So there's a certain urgency that's uh, going on here. Uh, and in, as in many places in, 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 uh, in the world today, uh, the guys that are gathering, are these guys aren't like lazy or whatever. I mean, these, they're just um, farm workers, uh, and, uh, and that's what they do. They bring their tools, they get ready for work, they get to the town center, they get to a designated area, and they wait with the hopes of, uh, of being, uh, being hired. Um, the second thing we know is the parable is emphasizing a right attitude in, in service. And uh, two kinds of, of workers, they're hired at different times of the day. Uh, the first laborers actually wanted a contract. Verse 2 says, the landowner, he agreed to pay them a denarius. He'll remark later, didn't we agree on this amount? Whereas the other workers that come along, they just go. They just, hey, whatever seems good to you. Uh, one is very trusting of the character and the integrity of the landowner. The other is very distrusting. Uh, the first guys get hired at the, at the beginning, certainly as if, if uh, uh, is in the story of the foreman pulls up with um, whatever he's going to haul these guys off, off with and throw them in the back of a wagon, whatever it might be. Uh, he's going to kind of look at these guys and kind of cherry pick. I need 10 and there's 40 guys. He's not going to pick the old guys. <laughs> he's not going to pick the guy with the lip. I mean, he's going to get uh, the young buff guys that he thinks can stand up in the heat of the day that he can get the most out of and so forth. Those are the guys that are going to be chosen first. Chosen first. And in the eyes of the world, what's chosen first, Jesus says, will often end up being last. In, in reality, these are the guys that end up grumbling uh, in, in the end. Uh, but, but they're chosen first. And they agree they're not going to go work until they know what they're going to get, apparently. So they agree on a day's wage as a denarius. It was a decent, this is what a Roman soldier got for a day's work. So this is, as uh, uh, old King James says, for a penny. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's trying to reflect a small amount. But it was, in that context, it was a, a normal day's wages. Uh, so it was, it was fair. It was fair for these guys. They agree and they go on. If you uh, look at verse 4, uh, it says, You also go and work in my vineyard, those that came later. I will pay whatever is right. So they went. Uh, the vineyard owner, uh, his word that he would do what is right, 
uh, is, uh, is enough for these guys. And certainly in the parable, who is the vineyard owner representing? God. So there are some that are willing to work for the Lord, but they're like Peter. What's in it for me? How much am I going to get? Which throne exactly? Uh, and there are others that... <laughs> And, and those guys would, from all appearance, would maybe the, the first workers that would look the best or have the most potential to accomplish something for the Lord. Uh, and yet there are others that just say, <laughs> I'm just glad to get a job. I mean, whatever you think's good. And, and obviously that's part of what Jesus is trying to show us here. So some, some workers wanted a specific reward. Uh, and then three in the parable, rewards are given. Yeah, in such a way to expose uh, attitudes. Uh, we note that the, uh, all the workers who were paid rewarded the same uh, amount, even though they had worked for different times. The workers who were hired at the 11th hour were paid a, a denarius. Uh, and certainly as this is going down, can you imagine Peter listening to the parable? Peter's listening to the parable. Okay, yeah, that seems good. And those guys are smart. They these other guys are kind of dumb. They, these guys, though, they made sure they knew what they were going to get. I mean, who goes out and works and doesn't even know what they're going to get for it? Those are the smart guys. And, and then uh, these other guys, I don't know. And then, and then he's listening to the story, and, and Jesus is talking about those that worked the 11th hour. They came out the 11th hour. They only worked an hour, and the guy gives them a full denarius. And Peter's probably thinking, all right, the guys that were out there, six in the morning, they're probably going to get like four or five denarius. I mean, they were going to get a lot because after all, if the guys that worked an hour, you know, get a denarius, what are these guys going to get? And I'm sure by the time it gets to them and they only get a denarius, <laughs> Peter's probably upset at that point and saying, that's not fair. That's, that's not fair. And then Jesus starts commenting on, and they were grumbling and they were complaining, but wasn't it fair? I mean, they got what they agreed for, wasn't it? Can I be generous with who I want to be generous? And I'm sure Peter was listening and thinking, there's something wrong here. And then Jesus keeps saying this thing about the last being first. I'm not sure if I get this, but I'm, I'm definitely not real happy uh, about what's being, uh, being said. But again, very obviously, Jesus telling the parable, very clever, the way that he lays it all out where he's paying the last and in the story, he does it. He tells the, the foreman, do it this way. Pay the last ones first. I want everybody to see, see what? See his, see his incredible generosity. Do you think the guys that worked an hour were just a little bit stoked when they, when they got a full day's wages? Who would have been hired at the end? The people nobody else wanted. It would have been the guys that did walk with a limp and maybe had a bad back and weren't in such great shape and and nobody, they wanted to work. Why have you been here all day long? No one would hire us. I'll hire you. And lets them work one hour and then pays them a full days. I think those guys are probably pretty stoked. I think they would say in the parable, the landowner is a very generous man. God is incredibly gracious and generous from their perspective. The next guys, they, they work a couple of three hours. I think they'd still be thrilled. The landowner is rich uh, and generous. He's so gracious with us. And it goes all the way down to the last guys. And then they got what they asked for. And it was fair. But they're upset. And apparently sometimes God is the landowner. We're the workers. It's possible for us to be grumbling and complaining <laughs> and upset. And we think God is not fair. We're not fair. Why? Because he's too generous with other people. <laughs> He's blessing others too much and not blessing me as much. So the parable would, uh, would go. But uh, they were all paid the same. This idea of grumbling, complaining against God was certainly a, an issue with the Pharisees. Uh, in Luke 5, 30, it says, The Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained, that's our same word, to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Complaining, grumbling against Jesus. Luke 15, 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear him, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered. <laughs> I like that word. There's a story behind it. I don't have time to tell, but same word, muttered. Then this man welcomes sinners and uh, eats with them. Again, there were those that would appear to be first the Pharisees, the religious leaders of, of the day. The people would have respected them, but in the end, 
In this story, they may end up being last, and part of their issue and problems was complaining and muttering against God, against Jesus. Paul warns about complaining against the Lord. He uses the children of Israel as an illustration in 1 Corinthians 10, 9. He says, we should not test the Lord as some of them did and were killed by snakes, and do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. It's easy sometimes. We have to be careful. I think Jesus says that we can actually grumble about other people being blessed. And he says it shouldn't be that way. Because in the end, when we finally stand against the Lord, if we follow the parable, we should all be blown away at the grace of God. How much will we receive for anything that we've sacrificed in this life? A hundred times as much. A hundred times as much. And to the people that nobody else would ever call or choose or use, even they get rewarded equally the same. And Jesus' point, when we see that, we should be thrilled. Praise God. He's so generous. He's so kind. No, nobody would do that. Well, only Jesus would do something like that. The guys that went out at the end, remember, they just said, hey, whatever seems right to you. Whatever seems right to you. And the Bible's full of passages like that. God is just in all of his ways. He is righteous in all of his judgments. Abraham, when he's concerned about his family in Sodom and Gomorrah and the potential judgment that's about ready to come down, Lot, his nephew, still there. In Genesis 18, 25, says, Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? Uh, again, and he will. And, uh, and far beyond our, our expectations. If there's anything we're going to be blown away when we stand before the Lord, it's going to be that he is even more gracious and more generous than any of us could have ever thought. Certainly that's part of the lesson that we want to see here. The other thing about this point is that all the workers' attitudes were exposed by the process, by, by showing them, by letting them see what the others got. Everybody's hearts. Some people were exposed for being, uh, understanding his generosity, but again, those that went out first, that appeared to be the best workers, the first workers, uh, their hearts were exposed uh, as well. Again, so some of the workers wanted specific reward uh, in the parable. Some are, uh, the rewards are given to expose attitudes. Fourthly, uh, in the parable, some were disappointed, uh, as we've said, in the reward, and that's in verse 13 to 15. Uh, the landowner reminds the early workers of their contracts. He said that each agreed to work for a denarius. He says he has a right to do with his money as, as he wants. And he asks if they are envious simply because he is, uh, he is generous. And uh, I have to uh, think about a, uh, a story, and I, I, uh, I wish I could have found the dates and the names and all that, but I couldn't find it in my files uh, yesterday. But true story, it was a missionary and his wife returning home after 40 years of service uh, to the Lord in, in Africa. Uh, and this was back in the 40s. They're arriving in New York Harbor uh, by ship. Uh, and as they come into the harbor, uh, they're up on the deck and they're passing the Statue of Liberty and they can begin to see uh, what appears to be a, a pretty large welcoming committee. Uh, and the, the guy that's there, the missionary, is pretty excited. You know, he had really no expectation or, or anything. And he knew, you know, a few folks would come down from the, uh, the uh, denomination and the mission society that initially sent them out and, uh, and so forth. But they get a little closer. And my goodness, I mean, there's, if the whole thing is decorated. There's a band playing. I mean, he's like, he's really getting excited. He's just kind of blown, blown away. He just had such, didn't have any kind of expectation like this. And then as they got just a little bit closer, he could then read the banner and everything and see how large the crowd was. And they were welcoming in the president of the United States. Apparently he was on the same ship. And he then began to grumble and mutter <laughs> and complain to his wife standing next to him that, uh, well, certainly, you know, they're you know, he had some expectation, maybe not all of this, but you would have thought after 40 years of serving the Lord, and now we're finally home that there would be someone at least to, to greet us in some form of uh, appreciation. And his wife said to him, well, honey, this is only New York. We're not home yet. 
the reward's not here. It's, uh, it's, it's with the Lord. In serving the Lord, we can get disappointed in time. We can begin to <laughs> grumble and, and complain, forgetting this concept of delayed gratification. The idea the reward is not in, uh, in this life. The, uh, uh, again, the other thing that we see about these guys that's very important is the fact that, uh, and I love this, is that uh, the guys that in the last hour that are called, as I said, no one would normally hire them. And, uh, and part of the point is there in terms of the application is that it's, it's never too late. Uh, it's never too late to, to, serve, to serve the Lord. Uh, there are some aspects of life, some, some jobs, some things you do that are, that are age-related. A number of years ago, we used to bring uh, uh, Tom Stipe, a good friend, over for some of the men's retreats and other things that we've done. Tom pastors are a very large Calvary up in uh, the Denver area. And for a number of years, uh, was the uh, chaplain for the Denver Broncos. And we still consider him a friend. And uh, to a lot of football fans out there. Uh, but anyway, he was a chaplain for the, the Broncos during the Elway years and stuff. And, and one of the years he was here was actually the weekend of the Super Bowl. So we'd done like a men's retreat on a Friday and Saturday. I don't know who planned that. But, uh, and then here on Sunday, he was here, and the Broncos were in the Super Bowl that year. So it was, it was kind of cool, because he was there giving us the play-by-play. -play. Oh, that guy's a, a brother in the Lord, and the, uh, that guy got saved last year, and uh, this guy, you know, he leads the Bibles. Oh, that guy's a really good Bible teacher, and oh, that guy, definitely, he's not saved. We're praying for him. So he's, as the game's going on, he's giving us the, uh, the spiritual announcement of, of everybody on the, on the Broncos uh, at, at, that, uh, at that time. Uh, after the game... He was just talking about the fact that uh, the guy that was the kicker that year was a very good friend of his, uh, solid brother in the Lord, getting ready to retire. That'd be prior to the uh, Elway, uh, or excuse me, uh, uh, the era of Elam. Elam. And thank you. And uh, so he was talking about uh, about him and stuff, and um, he was saying how. It's very difficult for these guys uh, in the NFL to, to retire. I mean, you know, by the time they hit 34, 35, 36, they're old. You know, they're pretty aged at that point and can't go on playing. They're pretty beat up too. And they have to step down. It's just the guys that know the Lord uh, uh, do, do, do pretty, pretty well. Like, like Jason Elam. I mean, he's, he's playing one more year now with the, uh, the Cardinals, I think. But he's already gone to seminary. He's, uh, he's uh, earned a, a master's degree in, in apologetics. He's already written his first Christian book. And he's looking for a life of, of ministry, you know, after the NFL. Uh, but, he said, uh, but Tom said a lot of the guys, it's like major depression, uh, tremendous anger. They, they really go through it. Sometimes, uh, having been their chaplain, they'll still kind of come around and come to church and, and talk to him and stuff. And sometimes he can uh, lead them to the Lord. But I mean, at, at 36, 37, it's like life is over at, at that point uh, for, uh, for them. But in the kingdom of God, that's never true. That's, that's never true. Uh, it's never too late. God takes us right, right where we're at. So uh, Charlie's gone on, so now I can talk about him a little more and use him as, a, as an illustration like I did in the first service. But uh, Charlie turned 95 today. That, uh, we just sing happy birthday to him. Uh, Charlie was baptized at 92. Uh, probably got saved sometime around when he's 91 or so. Uh, and some would say, boy, that's a shame. So late in life, I mean, I mean, you know, here the guys, uh, you know, at 90, 92, one foot in the grave and one on a banana pill. I mean, what, on a banana, what are you going to do for the Lord? But as they said, Charlie's probably already, in the last three years, has probably already led more people to the Lord than, than any of us sitting here. Maybe than all of us put together. And, and he sees his life as every day he's on borrowed time. And he's using it for the Lord. He's the guy in the last hour. Uh, he's the guy that the Lord says, it's never too late. It's never too late. Uh, you may have known the Lord for a long time and may have never had a sense the Lord could use your life or would use your life to lead other people to Christ, to be a witness for Jesus Christ. And this parable says it's never too late. And though and though somebody might look over a, a group of Christians and say, that's the best one, that's the best one, and that's the best one, that's not the way the Lord does it. Because the, the, the first will be last and the last will be, uh, will be first. 
And, uh, and uh, again, Charlie's just a great, uh, a great example of, of that. The other thing here under four is that the landowner illustrates the danger of, uh, of Peter's question from uh, Matthew 19, 27. Uh, the way, again, the way he pays the workers reveals their true hearts. Uh, not everybody's happy with the wages. Uh, and again, because of their own selfish nature that's being exposed. Uh, it's been said that whenever we find a complaining servant, we know that he's not fully yielded to the master's will. And so the question is asked, uh, what's in it for us? Let's go into the, the application, and we really get that in verse 16. As in the parable, the last workers will be rewarded first. Uh, the lesson for Christ's disciples is, is obvious. We're not to serve him because we'll receive an expected reward. Will we receive a reward? It depends. I mean, salvation is one thing. Uh, what you do for the Lord in this life, uh, you may receive a reward for. And actually, the Bible in the New Testament is pretty specific, talking about crowns that will be given out for different things. And, uh, but the idea is that we don't serve him for the reward. It's just something that, that comes at the end. I love the, uh, the song, that, uh, the little chorus that we sing once, once in a while. Uh, I'll serve you because I, I love you. You've given life to me. I was nothing until you found me. You've given your life for me. Heartache, broken pieces, ruined lives are why you died on Calvary. Uh, it, it, that, that's why we, we serve him. Uh, it's because of his love and his grace and what he's done for us. It's really not for a reward, this idea of what's, what's in it for me. I think that's the, the obvious uh, lessons. I think also had the early workers that had gone out simply said, pay us whatever you think is, is fair. I think they might have got like four or five denarius that day if they had just trusted what the landowner had for them like, like everybody else did. Don't ever ask God to give you what you deserve. You'll be disappointed every time. Uh, I like what uh, Paul says in his little dox doxology at the end of, uh, of Romans 11. Um, uh, he says, who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has given to God that God should repay him? Nobody, nothing. Uh, you know, we can never, as Pastor Chuck says often, we can never outgive God. We can never make God a debtor to us uh, because he's so gracious and, and so generous. I read a little uh, report the other day that was pretty exciting. Uh, Wycliffe uh, Bible translators are uh, basically are, uh, trying to, uh, you know, in the, in the next period of time, so many years, trying to do this program where it's like the final push to get the word of God into everybody's, everybody's language, all, reach all the people groups. And really with the uh, uh, use of computers and, and, and so forth, what they're able to do uh, in terms of translation is, is dramatically different than it was even, uh, even 20 years ago, much less 50 years ago. So there's some exciting things happening uh, in their ministry. And, uh, and apparently one, one person heard about that. And so he anonymously donated $50 million. That's a big donation. Uh, $50 million. I mean, anonymously, they probably would have changed the name of the ministry after him. Change, drop the Wycliffe. I'll give you $50 million, Just name it after me. Newman Bible Translators. Okay, give us the 50 million. We'll change it. Yeah. You got 50 million, we'll name the church after you. Put a little plaque over here. But I love it, the fact that, uh, that, he, that, that it's an anonymous. And I love the fact that there's, there's people out there that understand the parable. Is that to us, that's a lot of money. But his reward in heaven will be 100 times that much if, if we listen to the words uh, of Jesus here. Uh, but uh, again, but God's looking for uh, us to just uh, uh, take the opportunities that, that he's given us. Uh, the lesson for the disciples is, is obvious. It should be uh, for us as where we need to be aware of criticizing God, feeling that we've been left out. Secondly, the warnings for Christ's disciples are important. Uh, as Jesus illustrated in the kingdom, the last will be first, the first will be last. So apparently there's a danger of watching other workers and measuring yourself by them and wondering, why isn't it like, it's like this for them. It's not like this for me. And uh, uh, Paul says, judge nothing before it's, it's time. Uh, 
because in reality, what we think is the first could end up being the, the, the last in, in the end. Uh, there's certainly also a danger in becoming jealous of others while, while serving the Lord. And we could uh, certainly illustrate that in many ways, but Moses had his own problems with his brother and sister who were jealous over, over him. And uh, you remember uh, God's reaction to that in terms of Miriam. He strikes her with, uh, with, with leprosy. Uh, the second thing, the encouragement for Christ's disciples is that, it, as I mentioned before, it's, it's never too late, even though it's the uh, 11th hour. And, and part of the point here is to recognize that each of them during that day had different opportunities. The guys that went out uh, at six in the morning had a great, actually a greater opportunity to serve the landowner that day. They had a full day. What they would be able to accomplish in terms of bringing in the harvest was much greater than those that went out at nine, than those that went out at noon, than those went out at 11. All of them had different opportunities. And in the end, what they're rewarded for was not how much they accomplished during the day. Otherwise, the guys that went out first would have gotten more, right? But they were, they were rewarded based on their faithfulness. You know, we're, we're all certainly thank God for, uh, uh, for men like Pastor Chuck, for Billy Graham. And we would say that uh, they've had tremendous opportunity. And then they've been faithful in, uh, in that opportunity. We would naturally say that men like Billy Graham, and he was on television about a week ago, just turned 90 years old, still preaching the gospel from his wheelchair, would say certainly, man, he has been faithful, but certainly he's had tremendous opportunities in terms of preaching all over the world, uh, crowds of, of, of millions at times, and uh, so on and so forth. Tremendous opportunity. His reward in heaven, I think we would all assume, and I think it will be great. But that's not to say that there won't be some little old ladies who spent uh, 60 years on their knees interceding for his ministry and others whose reward actually may be greater because they were maybe even more faithful with the opportunity that the Lord gave them. Uh, and, and we need to understand that, uh, that dynamic uh, as well. Uh, we're just, we're, we're, all, we're all placed in different spheres of influence. We're all given different opportunities and, and different giftings. And it's our tendency to look at the people that sell the most books, have the biggest TV ministry within Christianity, have the most notoriety to make a natural assumption like Peter that their reward will be the greatest. And Jesus says, that's not necessarily so. Because it's all going to be based on, uh, on faithfulness. One day we're going to stand before the Lord uh, and we're going to hope to hear the words, enter now my good and faithful servant. Good in character and faithful in service. And that means different things to, uh, to different people. I wanted to uh, just kind of close in a letter from a, a missionary, a, a gal who's with the Southern Baptist Missionary. She went to uh, Iraq. Uh, and uh, this letter is dated March 7th, 2003. Uh, she was uh, killed uh, about a year later. March 15th, 2004. And uh, so this is one of those letters uh, that you get as a pastor. I've gotten uh, just a few of them, fortunately, that says, uh, if I ever go to be with the Lord on the mission field, then you need to open this and you need to read it. And, uh, and then we have uh, uh, discussions. We had conversations like that with our missionaries that, you know, when they go into places like Afghanistan and when uh, Kay went into Cambodia for a number of years and so, and so forth, uh, and fortunately, I've never had to open the letters, uh, but this one had to be opened, and, and this is what uh, Karen, Karen wrote. She said, uh, Dear Pastor Phil and Pastor Roger, you should only be opening this letter in the event of my death. When God calls, there are no regrets. I tried, tried to share my heart with you as much as possible, my heart for the nations. I wasn't called to a place. I was called to him. To obey was my objective. To suffer was expected. His glory, my reward. His glory, my reward. One of the most important things to remember right now is to preserve the work. I'm writing this as if I'm still working with my people group. I thank you all so much for your prayers and support. Surely your reward in heaven will be great. Thank you for investing in my life and spiritual well-being. Keep sending missionaries out. Keep raising up fine young pastors. In regards to any service, meaning her memorial service, Keep it small and simple. Yes, simple. Just preach the gospel. Be bold and preach the life-saving, life-changing, forever eternal gospel. 
give glory and honor to our Father. And then she includes a little poem called The Missionary Heart. I, don't, I, don't, I wasn't familiar with it. I don't know if she wrote it or had it, uh, adopted it from another author, but simply says this, uh, care more than you think is wise. Uh, risk more than you think is safe. Dream more than you think is practical. Expect more than some think is possible. And then she goes on and says, I was called not to comfort or success, but to obedience. There's no joy outside of knowing Jesus and serving him. I love the two of you and my church family in his care. Shalom, Karen. It's quite a contrast between Peter that says, what's in it for me? Oh, a reward? How good of a reward? Again, there's, uh, there's some understanding of, of self. Uh, there's more self-gratification that, that, than, than there is a delayed gratification. It's important to understand the, the concept that there will be a reward, but the issue is that, fine, <laughs> we just trust you, Lord, whatever. We're just here. That's not the way we're serving you, though. The, the, the Bible is very clear about rewards in, in heaven. I mean, that'll be, that'll be uh, glorious. I mean, when it talks about those crowns that are given out for very specific things, uh, uh, I've heard some people say that, uh, you know, I, I hope I get one so that when we stand before the throne, I have something to give back. But uh, that's probably a, a better attitude. Rewards in heaven. Uh, God will be far greater in terms of his generosity, than, than anything we can imagine. Again, everything is in the context, and if you look at the next verse, he comes back again to the theme of, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, I'm going to a cross, and, uh, but I will be resurrected. It's, he's kind of keep preparing them for what lies ahead because their fate is tied directly with his. And if we're really committed to him, so is ours. So he has to tell us that there is something that lies ahead. It will be difficult, but if you understand this concept of delayed gratification, and then just trust me for what that is, it'll, it'll be glorious. So rather than ask what's in it for me, just be surprised at the generosity of God. Don't be a, as we said the title of the message, don't be a worker with an attitude. <laughs> In the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. We are gathered together to lift up your name. Call on our Savior, fall on your grave. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. We are gathered together to lift up your name. Call on our Savior, fall on your grave. Hear the joyful sound of our offering. As your saints bow down, as your people sing, we will rise with you lifted on your wings. And the world will see that our God says, our God says, In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. We are gathered together to lift up your name, call on our Savior, call on your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down, as your people sing. We will rise with you, lifted on your
joyful sound of our offering. As your saints bow down, as your people sing, we will rise with you lifted on your wings, and the world will see that our God saves, our God